Chapter 1 Deltroid Deltroid, a murky, dark and desolate planetoid. Nothing but coarse black rock, cavernous valleys, jagged mountains and gritty dust storms. The sun hung in the mid-morning deltroid sky like a torch behind a lead curtain. Its windswept, dusty atmosphere made the days here as dark as the nights on Marcellius, if not darker. No one in their right mind would choose to live on a planet as void of life or light or water as this barren rock. However, signs of life were evident upon the planet's surface. Grouped together like emperor penguins were a cluster of little metal huts, crooked and windswept, battered and failing. There was debris strewn around the land from the huts that hadn't survived the weather. In the centre of this small community was a larger hut, at least 50 times the size, but equally as crooked and battered as the others. From speakers set amidst the huts an alarm sounded. A vile, high-pitched digital scream, yet the only sound that could possibly be heard over the constant roar of the sandstorms. Shady figures emerged, two or three at a time from the various tiny tin homes, twenty or thirty from the central dome, cloaked in thick ponchos made from gant lizard leather a futile protection to the callous weather. Tight together they scuttled into the violent, unforgiving conditions. Figures of various shapes and sizes, some humanoid, some alien, but always dressed the same. The cloak, the hood down over the face, the metallic bracelet about as dainty on the wrist as a brick on a butterfly's wing. They would scurry, or as close to scurrying as they could possibly reach whilst battling their way through the constant blast of rock fragments whipped up by the adverse winds. They made their way to a longer metal hut, a good 100 yards from their base, where numbers of over 100 of these shady figures would congregate and huddle together. It was more like a gathering than a queue, but it was a queue all the same. Minutes passed, and a roar from a distance began to battle for dominance over the howling winds. It emanated from the dust cloud to the east of the commune, the cloud that hid in its wrath a mountain of dull black. The congregation in the shelter shuffled into a slightly more organised mass of bodies, all looking out towards the vague shadow of the mountain as the noise grew ever louder. It was the scream of a jet engine growing closer, one which had choked on Deltroid's gritty air for far too long. It rattled and wheezed as its first visible sign began to present itself to the throng of people waiting huddled at the long narrow shed. A single red light peeped through the dust at a distance that was impossible to judge. It seemed to wink as gusts threw up varying depths of gravel before it. The sound grew more defined and shrill as the cylindrical rusty coloured craft finally burst from the cloud and began to pull up alongside the lengthy shelter. Its front was like a medieval jousting helmet, flat and thick, bent and buckled. The visor was merely a slit cut across it barely enough for a driver to see through, but then with sensors and beakers positioned in points across the land and remote computer assisted piloting devices in the craft itself, these vehicles didn't require a driver. Its body was a patchwork of welded panels, evidence of years of hasty repair jobs. The figures cowered behind their cloaks as the transport slowed to a halt, its jet engines kicking up plumes of black debris. The scream lowered to a growl, the rattle and wheeze became a knock and a whine as engines idled, and slowly, as the transport lowered to the ground, an automatic roller door the full length of the craft opened up, disappearing into its roof with an unhealthy burring noise. Another 100 figures, identically cloaked, spilled free from the bowels of the craft and barged past the 100 commuters in waiting. 
A series of green lasers projected from a small registry box over the carriage doorways worked overtime as they shot beams through the dust and located every single one of the 100 wristbands of those who left the vehicle. The red strip light around the wristbands briefly illuminated once hit. The passengers paid it no mind. Then as the next hundred entered, the lasers did the same, taking a digital register. This was one of many transports on this planetoid, dropping off and picking up each shift. They would carry people to and from the mines beneath the Black Mountain. There were hundreds of mountains on this relatively small floating rock, and the majority had several transports, each collecting and distributing commuters to similar shanty colonies based within relatively close proximity to the mountains. Deltroid was a charred cinder block, a small planet which had completely burnt through. Lava had boiled under the planet's crust many millions of years ago, like the many hospitable planets we know of, but at some point it had engulfed the planet, before entirely leaving its surface as black and ashen as the summit of a volcano. Beneath its abrasive blackened skin lay a handful of valuable minerals, gases and oils, all of which were the sole reason that any life form should assemble on this uninviting environment. These people were required to overlook the mining equipment that tore out the seamlessly endless supply of wealth from the gut of this bleak orb. They were here to do the manual grafting, any maintenance that was required to ensure that the facility ran a constant 628, a saying similar to our 24-7, but as the planet is so small here on this tiny globe, there were only six hours in a day, and so as to be in keeping with the rest of the Western Universe, in which a week usually consists of seven days, there are 28 days in a Deltroidian week, or four Deltroidian days to our one. And now you may wonder what the pay would be for such a hazardous job. At what price would you accept to go and work in these atrocious conditions? For what incredible wage would you willingly go to work in such an inhospitable, dark and dusty planet? Under the constant barrage of a sandstorm, operating dangerous mining equipment whilst under unstable ground in precarious tunnels that were not only likely to collapse on you at any given moment, but were also filled with lethal toxins and gases. The answer? For nothing. The cloaked figures who worked these mines were nothing but common criminals. Deltroid was one of the many penal colonies scattered throughout the galaxies. It wasn't one of the biggest, but it was one of the newest, having only been discovered for what it was about 30 years ago. And it had proven to be quite literally a gold mine, jam-packed with goodies for the corporate machine to digest and spew back out as credits. The majority of rocks excavated contained some priceless minerals. It wasn't a case of sending down prospector probes to locate the quarry. The whole of the miniature planet was the quarry. It was predicted that when they finally finished with the planet, the shell they leave behind would be too delicate to land any crafts on to retrieve the machinery. Deltroid was a hellish colony, making credits only for the few galactic governments and corporations who invested in the project. The prisoners here for various crimes are here to do hard time for nothing. Just how prison should be. A place so gruelling and repellent that those who consider partaking in any form of criminal activities are soon deterred. Well, you'd like to think so. In actuality, the very same governments who ship off their offenders to such penal colonies as Deltroid or Kramastav or Bolstick also have to adhere to a certain legislation known as the Mandaxim Treaty. This treaty is a book of laws which regulate the incarceration, detainment and treatment of criminal prisoners on such dangerous planets. The treaty was conceived by an assembly of political heads of planets and systems who met on the luxurious planet of Mandaxim to discuss and rush through these new laws and guidelines on the topic of hardship to felons. They rewrote the law in favour of these criminals, claiming that these foul, murderous, unsavoury, fearful and deceitful characters should have the right not to have to be put through such laborious tasks in such hostile conditions for any great deal of time. And why did they do such a thing? Why did this handful of politicians set about decreasing the punishment dished out to such fuggish and brutal criminals? The answer is a simple one. Because like most politicians, they too were crooked and corrupt, and at the time they decided the law needed changing, they were all involved in a major scandal, and one which was on the brink of being unearthed very soon. Knowing that jail time was just around the corner, they decided that they had better act quick and make it as easy and bearable for themselves as possible. They capped the work in time per universal day. 
which is 24 hours and not the 6 hour days that Deltroid has. And so as a result the 100 criminals who had just boarded the transport which was to carry them into a crack in the side of the mountain to the billions of credits worth of raw compressed crystallised rock would return in precisely one solitary hour. One hour became the limit for hard labour. One hour out of 24. That would be their shift. The rest of the time would be spent in their battered huts or the large recreational hut where they were free to roam, play games, get drunk and high and generally have a really easy time of it. In fact, prison time had become a bloody nice holiday. The guards there felt that having to live on this planet for months at a time on a ridiculously low wage was a pretty bum deal and would usually be the ones to bring in various illegal substances to kill the boredom and they would usually swap or gamble for drinks tokens in the recreation room with the inmates. And various games such as Puck Shot, Spears, Subark, and other recreational pastimes which were on hand. And as a result, they all got along very well. <laughs> 